All right. Nice to be back with everybody. Go ahead and get started tonight. Um, we will catch up on the capital budgeting sim um, after we get through tonight's discussion on the CAPM, as well as other aspects related to risk return and how the two of them should be aligned. So tonight, let's get started and just have a little chat about what we're going to go through. So, you know, we've talked throughout the course of the semester with time value of money and discounted cash flow valuation and through the Heritage Doll um, DCF, where we had this concept of weighted average cost of capital or discount rate. Where does that come from? Uh, tonight, we're going to get into <clears throat> the expected return. How do we go about calculating the expected return of a particular investment portfolio, if you will, collection of assets, okay, that has a certain level of systematic risk associated with it, okay, because there's risk in everything that we do, right? Some risk we can diversify away by layering in additional holdings that are uncorrelated to one another, but there is a certain amount of risk that is simply inherent within the system. Right. So we're going to talk about how we think about expected returns and variances of returns in a portfolio concept. Okay. And how do surprises within the expectations that Wall Street has, how do those surprises impact okay, the returns within the market? Right. So that leads us into this path of systematic risk versus unsystematic risk, all right? And by the end of the lecture tonight, we're going to be introducing the concept of the CAPM, capital asset pricing model, right? How do we relate the systematic risk of an asset as it relates to the risk-free rate of return, all right? and the market premium, the risk premium for the asset in order to come up with what is the expected return of the asset that we are investing in. Okay. And then how do we take that expected return of an individual asset and combine that with the expected return of multiple assets to build a portfolio of assets and what does the expected return and beta of that portfolio look like. Okay, so by the time we get to tonight, through tonight, right, we will have covered what we talked about in the in the recorded lecture last week as it related to a specific asset, right? We talked about what is the variance, what is the standard deviation of a specific asset, one specific asset, right? Tonight, we're going to talk about how do we combine multiple assets together to form a portfolio, what the variance of that portfolio is, what the beta of that portfolio is, and then how do we translate that into the security market line and the cap in. Okay. So expected returns, right? Stepping back into the recorded lecture from last week, right? Our expected returns, okay, we can look at from a statistical standpoint, all right, we can go back into the history of the market, right, and we can <clears throat> graph the returns during periods of time. In the case of last week, it was over an annual period, a holding period of one year, and we can see what the average return was, what the mean was. We can calculate what the difference between each individual year and the mean was. We can determine then what the variance is, okay, sigma squared. And then we can take the square root of the variance to get to our standard deviation to give us an idea of what the volatility is, okay, the dispersion around the mean of the returns, okay. Nobody has a crystal ball but we use historical patterns in the market to help us better understand what the future might look like, okay? So expected returns 
are based upon those probabilities of possible outcomes, right? <clears throat> So within the large cap space, the average return was about a 7% and the standard deviation, I believe was somewhere in the neighborhood of a, of a 16, okay? So based upon that, it gives us an idea of that 68% of the possible slash probable outcomes of the returns within the market, okay? Are going to fall between 7% and plus or minus one standard deviation. Okay, so it gives us at least an idea of the variability that we can expect based upon the assets that we have within our portfolios. So expected returns are based upon those probabilities of the possible outcomes that are going to exist. Okay, so when we think about it in terms of that context, all right, we're saying, all right, that the Expected means the average if the process is repeated many times. We expect that we should receive the average return of the market if the market is repeatable and is consistent over a long enough period of time. And we've got decades upon decades upon decades upon decades of history, repeatable history, during different phases of economic cycles, different um, global events, if you will, right, to get an idea of what, how the market is going to respond to certain changes within the marketplace. Okay, so our expected return in that context becomes the mean, the average, okay, of what we've seen in the past. The expected return that we see doesn't have to be a possible return. It just has to be the expected return based upon the average because we've got to process the market that's been repeated many times, right? So when we think about the expected return, okay, this formula here, all right, we have to look at, okay, what's the probability of a particular scenario occurring and what is my forecast estimated projected return in that particular state. Okay. Wall Street does this, your companies do this, okay, when they're evaluating projects, okay, we're looking at different states of the project, right. So in this case, we've got three different states. We have a boom case or best case. We have a normal case, base case, and we have a recessionary slash bear case, okay? Your companies do this. This is how they go about determining the viability of the projects that they're looking at and how they can most wisely allocate their capital. So in this case, we've got three different states that these two particular stocks are gonna find themselves in, all right? We, and we have probabilities around each of these states occurring, okay? Your companies employ teams of people to come up with the most realistic probabilities of the different states of existence, okay? So in this scenario, we've got stock C and stock T with their expected returns, okay? And we have probabilities for each of the three different economic states. So if the boom case or the bull case is 30% probability and the normal base case is a 50% probability, okay, then our recessionary or bear case slash worst case scenario has got to be the difference between 0.8 and 1. So the probability of the recessionary case is 0.2 because all the probabilities have to add up to 1. If there's only three possible states of existence that you're evaluating, right? Then there has to be a 100% chance that one of these three states is gonna occur, right? And so if the probabilities are 0.3 and 0.5, like this example is, then the bear case has to be the difference between the sum of the boom, the, the bull and the normal, okay? And one, right? So the probability of the recessionary case is 20%, okay? so. 
50% probability of a normal, 30% probability of a boom, and 20% probability of a bear case. And then we have projected returns in each of these cases. So the expected return, all right, of stock C across all three states is simply the sum product of the probability and the expected return. Okay, so the expected return of stock C is 30% probability of a 15% return plus 50% probability of a 10% return plus a 20% probability of a 2% return. Okay, and I realize I'm missing my 0 0.02 right here. I apologize for that, Anne, right here. Are you sharing the slides? I can't see the, the PowerPoint. Oh, crap. You guys, oh, thank you for finals. Thank you for speaking up. At least one person is paying attention. Thank you. Hold on. You guys see that now? Yes, now I can see it. Yes. Okay. Somebody speak up a little bit sooner next time. Sorry about that. All right. So we're talking about this here. Okay. So here's the, the you know the, the slide representation of what I was just referring to. So the expected return, okay, is equal to the probability of a particular state occurring times the expected return within that given state. And it's the sum product of all of the different states that might exist, okay? So when we get to stock C and stock T, all right, we have different probabilities of each of the three states occurring. So 30% of a boom, 50% of a normal, and then the difference between one and the sum of those has to be the recessionary case because the sum of the probabilities must equal 100%. Therefore, the probability of the bear case, recessionary case must be 20%, okay? We can calculate what the expected return of stock C and stock T look like by simply taking 30% times 15% and adding it to 50% times 10% and adding it to 20% times 2%. And when we do that for each individual holding, we can see that the expected return of stock C, okay, based upon the three different, the three different states that the uh, stock might find itself within is 9.9%. And that of stock T is 17.7%. Okay, so when we think of, when we think of risk and return, okay, and we've talked about this before, okay, sorry, I just opened the chat room, all right, um, we've talked about this before that you should always be rewarded for the commensurate level of risk that you're taking. Okay, so if you think about stock C and stock T with a 9.9% .9 expected return for C and a 17.7% return for stock T, which stock do you think carries the most risk? And you can hit the chat room. Okay. Which, which, which stock do you think carries the most risk, C or T? And we'll come back to it in just a second. Okay. So when we go when we go back to the concept of risk and return, right? The more variability, volatility, okay, distribution around the mean, okay? We should expect higher returns some years, but we should also expect to see lower returns 
in other years. Okay, the broader that distribution is, okay, the more variance we have, the broader our standard deviation is, okay, and the more volatile that our stocks are. Okay, so if we have a higher volatility, a higher standard deviation, okay, then we should also expect a higher reward, a higher return, because we're willing to take more risk. If our standard deviation is higher, it says we're taking more risk. And therefore, if we're taking more risk, we should be rewarded at a higher level than if we were otherwise not taking that level of risk. So just like we spoke last week, okay, on the recorded lecture about how to go about calculating the variance, Okay, which is the sum of the squares, right? The difference between the individual discrete annual return and the average return squared and the sum of all of those. Okay. We can now look at the variance in standard deviation for a portfolio or for different states of an individual holding. Okay. So we're simply building upon what was discussed in last week's lecture, okay? And instead of it simply being one state of existence, now we're adding multiple states of probabilities or possibilities, okay? And we're going to be calculating what the variance is based upon those different probabilities of outcomes. So we talk about variance and the standard deviation as the measure of the volatility of, re of returns. What percentage of returns is going to occur within that plus or minus one standard deviation around the mean, okay? And when we do that, we can use unequal probabilities for the entire range of possibilities. Okay, we can have different probabilities to encompass all of the possible outcomes that might exist, right? Okay, so that is also leading us to the down the path of this weighted average concept, okay, the sum product between the sum product of the probabilities and the variance that you calculate for the assets that you're looking at. So when we go back to that stock C and the stock T, okay, the variance and standard deviation kind of help us tell the story. So the question was, does stock C or stock T, okay, does stock C or stock T, which one of those has the most risk? Okay. And if we think about risk, we need to be thinking about variation around the mean. We should be thinking about volatility aka variance, aka standard deviation. So if we ask ourselves the question, which stock carries the most risk equals which stock has the highest standard deviation, okay, variability around the mean, then if we were to calculate the standard deviation for stock C and stock T, okay, we should expect to see stock T, right? have a higher standard deviation. We're taking more risk. There's more of very there's more variability around the mean, the average return with stock T than stock C because we're getting a higher return. That's what we expect. So let's see if that holds true. Okay. So when we look at the variance, remember, all right, the variance, okay, is is the expected return in a given state minus the mean return squared, okay? And then summed up, okay? Now all we have to do is weight it by the probability, okay? So on an individual asset, this is the variance, the sum of the squares, okay? All right, just like we talked about last week, okay, in our, in our recorded lecture, right? Now all we're doing is taking that difference, all right, that squared difference across each of the three states, and then summing them up to get a variance for the 
holding for the asset across the three different states of existence. So we had a 15% return, okay, with an average, a mean of 9.9%. So bear, bull case, 15%, normal case was 10%, so 10% minus the mean squared, okay. We had a bear case of 2% minus the mean squared, and then we have the probabilities, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, and 0.2. And the sum product of all of that gives us a variance that we then take the square root of to get our standard deviation of 4.5%, okay? So what does this mean? All right, our mean is 9.9%. Our expected return is 9.9%, right? We just calculated that based upon our three different economic states that our standard deviation is 4.5%. This means that between 9.9% .9 plus or minus 4.5%, so plus one standard deviation and minus one standard deviation, okay? It means that 68% of all of the probable returns are going to occur within that bracket. 9.9% plus or minus one standard deviation, 68% of the returns are going to occur within that range. Okay. We do the same thing for stock T, right? It was a 25% bull case, expected return of 17.7% the difference gets squared. Normal case, bear case, differences get squared, multiplied by the probabilities of each state, we get a standard deviation of 8.63, okay? So our theory that stock T carried higher risk proved itself true, okay? The standard deviation of stock T is greater than that of stock C. So if you're going to be taking more risk, if you're going to accept more volatility okay, in the hopes of higher returns, okay, <clears throat> then you should be rewarded for taking the additional level of risk. And in this case, you are taking nearly, okay, nearly a 100% increase in risk, okay? You are taking almost twice the risk with stock T than you are with stock C. Okay. So when we go back to the returns and we look at a 9.9% expected return and a 17.7% return, okay, that percentage difference okay, is fairly comparable to the percentage difference in the level of risk volatility that you're willing to accept to achieve the potential higher reward, okay? So when we think about going about calculating the expected return or the variance or the standard deviation of an individual asset, okay, that now has multiple possible states, okay, probabilities of certain outcomes occurring, we can use the same math that we've been accustomed to using through the calculations of standard deviations and variances okay, to determine what the variance and standard deviation is for the individual asset across those multiple states of existence. Okay, so the probability, the probability times the difference between the expected return and the expected mean return squared, okay, across all the three different states gives us the variance for that individual asset in three possible states of existence. Okay. And the point being is that you've got a 9.9% .9 expected mean return 
compared to a 17.7% expected mean return. And the variance in the standard deviations for each one of them okay, are in line with you're taking more risk, you're getting a higher return for the risk that you're taking. Okay. <clears throat> Right, so we can we, we can move this to Excel if you'd like to, but in general, what I'd like to do is I'm just going to throw this up on on Moodle, and I'd like for you guys to go in and just use this as one of your practice problems by looking at calculating what's the expected return, what's the variance, and what's the standard deviation of this ABC company within this example here. Okay, so expected return, probability times return. For each of the four states, it, everything gets added up. Okay, that becomes your expected mean return for ABC Incorporated. Okay, what is the variance? Right, and if you want, we can go to Excel. So if you want to do this in Excel right now, we can go and do it. Just hit the chat room if you'd like for me to do this. The variance, each individual state's return minus the expected return. Yes, please. Okay. All right, let's do it. I love math. All right, let me fire up. I want to fire up Excel real quick here. All right. Okay. So we have boom, normal, slowdown, and recession. And we have the probability. Okay. 0 0.25, 0 0.5. 0.15 and 0.1. And we have the expected returns. Okay. All right. So, what is the expected return across all of the different states? Okay, so our expected return is the sum product of the probability times the return. Okay, so sum product okay, of the probabilities times the returns. So our expected return is 8.05%, right? That is our expected return of ABC based upon the four different economic states, okay, that ABC could possibly find itself in, okay, the budgeting, the forecasting that the company is doing has said that in these four possible economic states, we expect our company to deliver these returns and based upon our geniusness that our actuaries have, Okay, they have come up with probabilities of each of these different economic states occurring. Therefore, based upon the sum product of the probability and the return in each of the four states, we should expect 100% of the possible outcomes. Okay, the average, the, the average of all of the 100% of the possible outcomes should be 8.05%. Okay. 
Does anybody not know how to use the sum product function? I can go through it again real quick. Just hit the chat room if you want me to go through that again. Okay, so we have the, the mean. Now we've got the mean, right? So how do we go about calculating the variance? Well, the first thing we got to do is we have to calculate the difference to the variance, right? So the difference to the variance is simply the return in that given state minus the variance. Okay. For each of the four states, the difference, okay? So what we're doing here is we're calculating this, okay? The return in each state minus the expected return, right? So we're calculating what's in the parentheses right here. Okay. So the difference to mean now we square it. And our variance is the sum of the squares. Okay. So if we know that our variance is the sum of the squares, which is what we just calculated, we can now calculate the standard deviation as the square root of the variance. So now we know that the variance, okay, when we take the square root of the variance, we can get the standard deviation. And now we can tell the variability. What's the variability of all possible outcomes? Okay, so the average is 8.05%. That's our expected return. But we have a standard deviation, excuse me, of 13.7%. Okay, so 68% of all the possible outcomes in terms of returns for ABC Inc. are gonna fall between 8.05% plus or minus one standard deviation or 8.05% plus 13.7% and 8.05% minus 13.7%, okay? So it tells us, gives us an idea of the variability of the returns of this particular company. Are there any questions on how we went about doing this? Feel free to ask. If you want me to slow down, I'm happy to do that. Okay, no questions. All right, everybody's got it. Okay. So 68% of all the possible outcomes in a normal distribution, okay, we're not talking about any sort of, you know, bleptocurtic or, you know, platocurtic type kurtosis environment. It's a normal distribution around the mean. 8.05% plus or minus one standard deviation gives you 68% of all the possible outcomes of the returns that relate to ABC Inc. Okay. Okay. So when we think about assets, all right, we've been talking about an individual. I'm going to go back to this example in Excel real fast. I want to show you just one thing real quick. Okay. 
Okay, so when we take the difference to the mean, okay, we then square the difference, okay, for each one of the different states of economic existence, okay? And then we have to sum up each one of them, okay? And I made one critical mistake here when I did it, okay? As my brain was going, I forgot to weight everything. So not only when we're, when we're talking about the different states, right? We have to weight each of the returns to calculate the mean, okay? We also have to weight each one of the squares based upon the probability that each one of those squares represents across each of the four economic states, okay? So again, even in this, we have to weight this final square, the difference, okay? So when we do that, times the probability, okay? And we sum everything up, okay? We can see that the weighting is crucial okay, to the final answer that we get, all right? So the probability not only factors into the expected return, which we just calculated, okay, which factors into the, the square of the difference between the expected return and the, and the expected return of the portfolio, okay, as a whole, but it also plays into the actual probability of that variance occurring. So we have to continue using the probability to the very, very end. Okay, so I'm, I apologize for not taking it that one step further. Okay. So we have to weight the variances, okay, and then sum the weighted variances to get to the final standard deviation within the ABC example here. Okay. Does anybody want me to go back through that one more time? Is anyone still out there? Yes. <laughs> It seems like you're counting the probability like twice though, because isn't it already, wasn't it already a factor the first time? It's a factor within the expected return. Okay. All right. But when we get to the difference, this, the difference between the actual economic state return and the difference between that economic state return and the expected return, okay, we're not, we're, we still have to weight the variance. We have not adjusted the variance for the probability of each state. We have calculated an expected return based upon the probability of an economic state existing, okay? That's what we did here, right? we calculated an 8.05% expected return, okay? Based upon the probability of each state, but now we have to go calculate the variance, okay? And the variance is each economic state's return minus the expected return, okay? For each of the four different economic states, and then the variance, okay, is the square of the difference. Okay, so step one is to calculate the difference. Step two is then to square the difference, right? So if we look at the, what we're trying to do here, okay, we're trying to calculate everything to the right-hand side of this, the probability of each occurrence, right? So we're trying to calculate this, the economic state return minus the expected return squared. We're trying to calculate all of that, okay? Which is what we're doing here, okay? So the expected return, remember, hold on, I'm, uh, we're slide six. 
we said the expected return, right, is the sum product of the probability of each economic state times the return in each economic state, right? So that's what we've done here. We, the expected return is the sum product of the probability P1 times the return in that particular instance. So that's what we're doing right here. So probability times return plus probability times return plus probability times return plus probability times return gives us the expected return. So this expected return, okay, ER is what we just calculated, probability times return. Okay, so last week we were dealing with one company, right, in one economic state. Simple, right? And one company had returns whatever, over four years of whatever they were. And we calculated an average return. We calculated a variance okay? and we calculated a standard deviation, but it was for one company over a period of four or five, six, seven years, whatever it was. But now we're saying, all right, we're gonna take that same company and we're gonna project what the expected returns might look like based upon different economic states and different expected returns within each of those given economic states. Okay. So to find a weighted average return over 100% of the possible outcomes, that's what, that's what this is, right? 8.05% 8 .05 is the expected return over 100% of all of the probable slash possible outcomes that could exist for this company. Does that make sense? Anyone? Yes. Okay. I got a yes. I got a yes from somebody. Okay. So the expected return over all four pi, and I could, you, know, you could do whatever. You could take, you could have a boom one, a boom two, a normal one, a normal two, a recessionary, a slowdown. You could have 15 different economic states, but the probability of all 15 of those states has to equal one. Okay. And the math would still be the same. The expected return across all of those possible outcomes, these possible states, is 8.05%. Obviously, the more economic states that you have, obviously, the more analyses that you run, the different scenarios that you run, okay, the more tightly tuned this expected return is going to be, okay, but nonetheless, the math is still the same, okay, it's the sum product of the probability and the return for each of the four economic states, okay, so what we've done here is exactly this. The expected return across each of the four states is the sum product of the probability within each state times the return in each state. That's the expected return, 8.05%. Okay, now. Come on. Now, now what we're saying is Tell me what the variance and standard deviation is for ABC Inc. All right. Across these four economic states to get us to what is the expected return plus or minus one standard deviation, plus or minus two standard deviations, plus or minus three standard deviations. So the expected return is 8.05%. We just did that. What's the variance? Well, how do we go about calculating the variance, period? For one asset, forget the, dip, the four different states. How do we go about calculating the variance for one particular asset in one particular period? Okay, well, we take the difference between the return in that period and the expected return. That's what this is, the difference to the mean. Okay, 
So the return in that period minus the expected return. Okay. And we square it. Okay. The square of the difference. All right. So we took, we took the difference to the mean, the difference to the expected return, and we just simply squared it. Okay. Why do we do that? Well, because if we want to think about what is the variance of this company across all of these different states of existence, okay, we're back into sum product mode. Okay, we're back into the sum product of the probability of each state and the variance within each state. Okay, so we have to then square the difference. We're calculating this. Okay, so we square the difference. And then we multiply it by the probability. Okay, multiply it by the probability. Okay, and then we sum everything up. Okay, so just like we did for an individual company, the sum of the squares, that's what we're doing here. Except now all we're doing is we're weighting the squares based upon the probability of that economic state occurring. Okay, so when we weight the squares, okay, and we sum everything up, we get the variance, which is the standard deviation squared, okay? So in order to get the standard deviation, we then just take the square root of the variance and we see that we have a, a standard deviation of 5.17%, okay? Questions about that? Moving on. Okay, so we're building into this concept of portfolios, okay? So during last week's lecture, we were talking about one specific entity, right? One specific asset, all right? One specific economic state with historical returns, right? We were calculating the arithmetic or geometric average historical returns. And based upon that mean, we could then calculate the variance, okay, for each one of those years for one, one company, okay. From there, we could then calculate the standard deviation over that period of time that we were looking at in order to determine the distribution, okay, of possible outcomes of future returns. but we were looking at one company based upon a, an annual return. Now we're taking that one company, okay? And we're digging a little bit deeper. We're taking that one company and now we're doing some forecasting. We're gonna do some budgeting, okay? Based upon multiple possible economic states that might exist for that one company, that one asset, in order to determine a variance and a standard deviation for that one asset across the possible outcomes and the probability of each of those outcomes occurring. Okay, so we're getting more granular in our ability to forecast, okay? But up until this slide, we've still just been talking about a singular asset, okay? Stock C or stock T or, or ABC Inc. or, you know, take your pick company, right? 
We had historical returns that we were able to calculate variances and standard deviations on. We've now taken that to another level of forecasting and looking at expected returns based upon different economic states, possible states of existence, and the probability of each of those possible states existing. Okay. And now we're going to take a look at combining multiple assets into a portfolio and then being able to determine the variance and the standard deviation of the portfolio. Once you know, once you know how to calculate the variance and standard deviation of an individual asset across multiple possible states of existence. Okay. Understanding how to translate that into a collection of assets is actually fairly straightforward. Okay, and that's what we're gonna get into right now. Okay, so some of you who work in finance already know this, but when we talk portfolios, all right, it's nothing more than just a collection of assets, whatever those assets might be, okay? But what's most important that we understand, all right, is this, the assets risk and return, okay, are extremely important in how the overall portfolio risk and return can expected can be expected to turn out. Okay, so when we talk, when I design portfolios for clients, like I just did one the other day, on one of my larger clients, um, I look at standard deviations, expected returns, alpha, beta that we'll talk about here later in this uh, in this segment. Okay, sharp ratios, things like that. But I look at the standard deviations to see if what I'm getting on the return side is commensurate with the level of risk that I'm taking or that I'm asking my clients to take. So when we think about the risk return trade-off within a portfolio, okay, it's measured by the portfolio's expected return and standard deviation, okay? Just like it is with the individual assets. So everything we've done from talking about stock C or stock T or ABC Inc, all the math that we just worked through in terms of calculating standard deviation and variances and expected returns, all of that can now be done at the portfolio level, just as we did with those individual assets that we just went through. Okay. So we have another weighting, Morgan, we have another weighting that we now have to consider. Okay. No. Another weighting, another <laughs> multiplication. Okay, so suppose in this example, okay, we've got 15 grand that we're going to put in the market, right? And we've just bought four positions within the portfolio 2,000 of Citi, 3,000 of Coca Cola, 4,000 of Intel, 6,000 of BP, right? How much does each one of these holdings represent within the portfolio, right? You are all smart people. I do not need to teach you how to calculate the weighting of this. You can do it quickly in your head probably, all right? But just for grins, city, $2,000 of city divided by $15,000 total gives you 13.3%. That's how much of the overall portfolio city represents. Okay? And then you do that for each of the other three holdings. Right? Obviously the sum of all of this equals 100%. Okay, so we now have a weighting for each of the individual assets that we have within the portfolio. Okay, so if we thought about expected returns for an individual asset, okay, then what's the expected return of the portfolio? The expected return of the portfolio is nothing more than the sum product okay, of the weighting of each holding and the expected return of each holding. Okay. So now we have to then layer on each 
individual assets within the portfolios, expected return, standard deviation, variance, okay? So we calculate each of those pieces for each of the holdings that we have within the portfolio. And then we weight each one of those by that individual holdings weight within our portfolio. And we sum everything up and that gives us the expected return of the portfolio. Okay, so let's keep things real simple. All right, if we have these expected returns for each of those four holdings. Okay, so you did some math, okay, or the Wall Street analysts did some math and they came up with expected returns across four different economic states and four different probabilities of those four economic states occurring, okay? And you calculated the expected return for each one of these four positions, okay? So the sum product of the probability times the expected return for each of those economic states for each of the four holdings, okay? you came up with the expected return, right? What's the expected return of the portfolio? Well, it's the sum product of the weighting of each holding times the expected return. So 13.3% weighting for city times the expected return of 19.69% plus 20% weighting for Coca-Cola at a 5.25% expected return, so on and so forth. The sum product of the weight of each asset and the expected return of each asset. So when we do that, the expected return of this $15,000 portfolio is 15.41%, okay? That is the expected return for this portfolio, this collection of assets for positions, okay, with weightings, that you calculated based simply based upon the dollar weighted average for each of the four holdings within the portfolio. Okay. Any questions about that? You see how all this is building? Okay, so think about like city here, right? 19.69% expected return, right? Well, what do we have like underlying all of that? Okay, so 19 point, I'm just gonna throw some numbers out here just, just for the sake of, you know, uh, discussion, all right? So we've got a 19.69% return, right? But what, what, under, what, was, what underpins that number? Well, maybe you've got a, a boom one and a boom two and a normal one and a normal two and a recessionary one. All right, and then maybe a deep recessionary one. Okay, you've got how many how many states is that? One, two, three. You got six different economic states, right? Okay, with some probability. Okay, with some probability and some return for each one of those different states, right? So you've got something that would have gone into each one of these. Excel boxes, right? And then we could take the sum product of all of that and that would give us 19.69, right? That gives us the expected return. And then guess what? We can do the same thing we did up here, okay? We can calculate the difference between the return for each one of those six states and the expected return. We can square the difference. We can weight the squares based on the probability and we come up with a variance Okay, we come up with a variance and a standard deviation, okay, for city, okay, based upon these six different economic states, okay? And when we do this, right, city then represents a 13.3% represents a weighting in our overall portfolio, okay? Therefore, when we go to create the final values for our portfolio in terms of variance and standard deviation of the portfolios, okay? We would simply take 
13.3%, that's our weighting of city, 13.3%. 13.3% times our expected return, that gives us the portion of our portfolio expected return that is attributable to city. We take 13.3% times our standard deviation. Okay, see where we're going with this? Okay, and that gives us the portion of our overall portfolio standard deviation that relates or is attributable to city. Okay, and we do that for each of the four different positions that we have and we can calculate the overall portfolio risk statistics. Okay. Professor, can you just um, go back to the previous slide that had the, uh, I guess the actual problem so that I can write the numbers down in Excel? This one? Yeah, if you could just stay on that for like one minute. Yeah, sure. I'll put, I'm gonna put all these slides up too, by the way. Yeah, I'm just putting it um, in Excel so that I remember how to actually solve it. So, yeah. And once you build, like this is the beauty, like once you, in Excel, right? Once you build, once you build this, right, for one company, obviously so long as each of the companies that you're going to be evaluating has the same number of economic states, right? All you really have to do at that point is just update the probabilities and the expected returns and everything else gets done for you and bam, you're done. So you do it once and no matter how many different holdings that you've got, the, the future work that you have to do is minimized. Okay, are we good? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, so again, portfolio variance. It's the same thing. All right, it's the same thing. Calculate the return for each state. Okay, once we calculate the return for each state, we can treat the portfolio kind of the same way that we treat each asset. And all we have to do at that point is calculate and compute the portfolio variance and the standard deviation using the same formulas as an individual asset. Okay, once we do it for each asset, then we just weight the portfolio the same way. All right, so let's go back to Excel. All right. And let's just kind of go through this example. You guys want me to go through this example in Excel? Would that be helpful? If you guys. Yeah, are, yes, yeah. please. Okay. All right. Oh, I hear babies. I miss it when my kids aren't home. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So let's think about how we're going to go about doing this. So the first question that we've got is what are the expected return and standard deviation for each asset? Okay, so let's walk through that piece because we're going to step through it. Okay, so for each asset, all right, the expected return, right? So the expected return, okay, for asset A is equal to, right, the sum product of the probability times the expected return for each of the economic states, okay? And if you don't understand how to use the sum product function, 
it is one of the best functions ever to exist within Excel. Okay, okay. so we have a 6% expected return okay, for company A. What is it for company B? Some product of probabilities and the expected returns for each one of the different states. Okay, so those are our expected returns, All right? All right, now, this is where usually I personally, I will start breaking it down by individual assets at this point. All right, because at this point, I wanna start knowing, okay, on an individual component of my portfolio basis, I want to start knowing what the variances and standard deviations are. So at this point, I will typically start breaking this out into individual holdings. So what I'm going to do is just put A here, okay? And I'm going to bring my expected return down, okay? And I'm going to set that equal to 6%, okay? And now what I want to know is boom and bust. Okay, what is my difference to mean? Okay, so I'm going to start calculating the, I'm going to work on calculating the variance, right? So the first thing is I need to know the difference to the expected return, or if you would like for me to be more clear, the difference to the expected return. Okay, so my difference to the expected return, right, is equal to, okay, the 30% minus my expected return. Okay. And I'll do the same thing for the bust. Okay. So the, now I have the difference, right? Okay. Between the two. Okay. And now what I have to do is we have to calculate. What do we have to calculate next? Anybody remember? Is it the variance? Say or the again. expected is it the it's either the expected return of all or the variance, right? We're still working on the variance. So right now we're on the variance. Okay, we're calculating variance. So once we calculate the difference to the expected return, what's the next thing we have to do once we calculate the difference? Square the square. We have to square the difference. Okay. Right? And our variance is, do we stop here or what do we have to do next? Sum the square differences. We have to, well, okay, but there's one other step that we got to do before we sum the squares. Weight the squares? So weight the difference? Yes, we got to weight the squares. Okay, so we have to weight this based upon the probability. Right? Okay, so now the variance is the sum of the weighted squares. And the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. Okay. All right. Let's see if Does that makes sense. So we have the expected return, all right, which was the sum product of the probability of each state and the expected returns of each state. Okay. We first calculate the difference. Okay, we're calculating this here. This is what we're working on, right? We have the difference. So the return in each state minus the expected return. Okay. Okay, that's what's within the parens. 
we have to square that difference to get the rest of the product here. Okay. And then we have to weight the squares based upon the probability of each economic state with the P, the P within each state. So N is two. So from I equals one to two, there's only two states. Okay. So we have the weighted boom, we have the weighted bust, and then we sum everything up. Okay, we sum everything up and okay? that gives us our variance. And then the square root of the variance, right, gives us the standard deviation for company A. Okay. Any questions about that so far? Okay. All right. So that's for company A. Now I'm just going to kind of copy a bunch of stuff so I don't have to redo it. And I'm going to come down here for company B. Okay. Right, right. So the expected so return return. for company B was 13%. Okay. The difference was yeah. minus five, minus 13. Oops, botch that up. Function F4, thank you. Okay. We now have the square of the difference. Okay. So minus five, minus the expected return and then minus 25 or plus 25 minus the expected return. So that's the difference to the expected return. Okay, we square the difference. Okay, we weight the squares. Okay. We sum the squares and then we calculate the standard deviation. Okay, so now we have all of the risk metrics that we want for company A or asset A and asset B. Okay. So now let's take a look at what the actual portfolio looks like. Okay, so we've got the expected return for each asset and we've got the standard deviation for each asset, right? We've got everything that we need. Okay, and now What's the expected return for the portfolio? Okay. All right. Well, it's fairly straightforward, All right? It says if we have 50% of our money in asset A and 50% of our money in asset B, okay, that the portfolio expected returns are 12.5% and 7.5%. Okay. So the expected return here. is nine and a half percent. Okay. All right. So what is the standard deviation for the portfolio? Well, quite frankly, since you've got 50% of your money in asset A, you know the other 50% has got to be in asset B, then you know that the standard deviation of the portfolio has got to be the weighting of each of the assets times the standard deviation for each of those assets. So the standard deviation of the portfolio, okay, is nothing more than the 50% weighting that you're given times the standard deviation of asset A plus the 50% weighting times the standard deviation of asset B. So the weighting, the standard deviation, the weighting of the standard deviation within the portfolio is 10.5%. So that is the portfolio standard deviation. Okay, does that make sense? The mechanics of how we're doing this. Okay. 
Yes. Anyone? Yes, it makes sense. Okay. All right. Yay. Okay. So again, these slides are going to be put out there onto Moodle for you. I would encourage you to go back through, take a look at this particular slide 13-15, okay? And do the work that we just did in Excel, except now you've got a 60-40 split instead of a 50-50 split, okay? So just go back in, go into Excel, rework the examples. You've also got three different economic states instead of two, okay? So it's slightly more complicated, but once you've done it for one, once you've done it for one asset, you've done it for the second asset. All right. So just if you put everything into Excel the right way the first time, it's usually just a very simple copy paste. Okay. But work this problem. Okay. Because on the final exam, you're going to have to go through and you're going to have to wind up calculating variances and standard deviations of individual assets. Okay, individual assets with multiple economic states and then portfolios with multiple assets with multiple economic states. Okay, everything just builds kind of on top of each other. But once you understand the basic mechanics of an individual asset, you can easily translate that to a portfolio of thousands of assets simply based upon those assets waiting within the portfolio. Okay, so Work this problem on your own in Excel as practice. All right. So when we think about expected returns, right? Expected returns are great. Right? It's a data point. It gives us an idea of what we should expect under different forecasted economic business cycle situations, right? So realized returns, the ones that actually occur within the marketplace, right? Realized returns, most often than not, not equal to the expected returns, right? But it's all we got. If we're thinking about having to forecast into the future, we don't have any realized returns. We've got a history of returns, and we're using that history of returns to create the expected returns in the form of the mean and the standard deviation. We're using the history to get an idea of what the future might look like, okay? But realized returns are usually not equal to the expected returns, okay? There's some component, okay, of expectation, but there's also unexpected situations that impact realized returns. I mean, think of the COVID situation right now. How many businesses have had realized returns that were negatively impacted because of an unexpected component called coronavirus? Okay. There's still realized returns, right? And they'll still factor into the risk metrics for the company they'll still factor into changing the standard deviations, changing the variance, changing the historical returns, okay? But they were unexpected returns that factored into the realized returns, okay? So at any point in time, as you already know, those unexpected returns can either be positive news or negative news. So it can change the outcome one way or another, positive or negative. Okay. However, however, over a long enough period of time, okay, we expect to have a relatively equal number of unexpected and expected outcomes such that the average of all of those unexpected components is essentially zero over a long enough period of time. Okay. So when we think about those announcements and the news that's in the media all the time, every single day, okay, 
even like today, Governor Hogan announced again, I, I think he put even more restrictions on, you know, restaurants again today. Um, those announcements can contain positive and negative sentiment. Okay, today was probably negative. Two, three, four months down the road, when things re, you know, open back up again, that's going to be a positive shot to the system. Okay. But it's that surprise component, right? It's what Wall Street is not factoring in. It's what they don't see. It's what they're not expecting. Okay, that is what will impact the stock's price and its return. Okay, because if we believe in efficient markets. If we believe that all of the information that we have okay, is available to the public, okay, then the price of the stock within the marketplace, the price of the asset within the marketplace, okay, should be easily determined. Okay? But it's when we get those unexpected announcements, those surprises, that's what creates the volatility in an asset's price that it's traded at within the market. Okay. So the efficient market theory is based upon okay, the fact that we as investors, we are trading based upon the unexpected portion of the announcements. Otherwise, what's the point in trading? Okay, if there's no ability to generate returns, okay, then why even bother trading? So the easier it is to trade on the surprises, okay, the more efficient the market should be in those circumstances. Okay, that's why we do the research. The only reason why the markets exist is because we've got, as a society, a global financial community, everyone is doing research coming up with more information, new forecasts, new product developments, new launches, okay? They're creating these surprises for all of the companies that are being traded within the financial system, okay? So the efficient markets involve random price changes simply because we can't predict what's gonna happen tomorrow, okay? We can't predict those surprises that are going to come out tomorrow. We talked about how a in a truly 100% efficient market on the day that a pharmaceutical company, whatever, call it Pfizer, right, announced their coronavirus vaccine, that in a truly efficient market with no emotional behavior whatsoever, that the price of Pfizer should have made a step change up to its new normal. Because now all of that new information is in the market and that stock price should have reacted perfectly efficiently and the stock price should have made a a vertical jump to its new efficient price and then flattened out completely. But we know that's not what happened. Okay. We know that there was euphoria in the market. We know that there was an emotional connection to getting a, a vaccine for the coronavirus. And what happened to the Pfizer stock price? It overshot its balanced price. Okay. And it has since retreated a little bit. And eventually at some point in time, we'll revert back to its new normal with the new information fairly and efficiently priced into the market. Okay. So when we think of diversification and we think of risk, okay, we have to think of two different types of risk that exist. The first type of risk is the systematic risk. Okay. What risk is inherent within the system? Okay, that impacts a large number of assets. Okay, what can be consistent within the economy that no matter if you're in telecommunications or pharmaceuticals or industrials, okay, that a systematic change okay, presents a risk to everybody's business. Okay, so this type of risk is non-diversifiable. This is simply the risk that exists because you choose to be in the market. Okay. Now, some industries are less volatile to 
systematic risk, are more insulated to systematic risk. Okay? But nonetheless, there are risks that exist across every single sector within the market. And no matter what you do, you cannot diversify away 100% of the systematic risk. It's impossible. Okay? And this type of risk relates to things like GDP. Okay? This year, we're going to get hit on GDP because of the coronavirus. Right? That's going to have significant impacts across a broad spectrum of asset classes. It is a risk that is inherent within the system. Okay? Inflation, interest rates, okay? all of these things affect multiple sectors, not just one. Okay? Interest rates impact telecommunications because of their borrowing as it relates to building new telecommunications infrastructure. Right? Impacts pharmaceutical companies borrowing okay, to help fund research and development. Okay? So GDP, inflation, interest rates, other risks that are inherent across the entire system are risks that we cannot diversify away. Market risk. Okay? So remember, systematic risk is non-diversifiable. The second risk component is unsystematic risk. Okay? These are risks that impact a limited number of assets unique risks, asset specific risks. Again, pharmaceutical industry, right, has to deal with FDA regulatory approvals. Okay. Verizon doesn't have to deal with regulatory approval from the FDA, maybe the FTC, but not the FDA. Okay. So there are risks that are unique to specific asset classes. Right. Labor strikes, part shortages within the automobile industry, okay, things that impact a particular asset class or industry sector. Okay. We can diversify some of that out by simply building portfolios that are well-rounded and well-balanced. Okay. We can diversify out a lot of the unsystematic risk simply by having additional holdings within our portfolio that might move in opposite directions, okay, when a labor strike happens. You might be down or be losing money on your automobile holdings, okay, but what's an industry sector that actually might be up if there's a labor strike? Any, anybody got an idea? If people aren't going to work and they're staying home or what industry might be up? Groceries, food, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Okay, exactly right. Things like Kimberly Clark, Procter & Gamble. People are using more toothpaste and toilet paper and paper towels because they're at home and not at work. Because if they're at work, then the companies would be buying those things for them. Okay, so you have ways to offset the pluses and the minuses. So we can diversify out some the unsystematic risk simply based upon the number of holdings. Okay, but what you're going to see here in a couple of slides is that you do get to a point, okay, where you are able to diversify out this unsystematic risk to a point where it becomes almost an asymptote to the systematic risk that's inherent within the portfolio that you have, at which point no amount of additional holdings is going to eliminate further the unsystematic risk, okay? So when we think about returns, all right? So for, for now until, let me just count the slides here. Everything that we're gonna talk about right now, okay? until the end of the lecture is going to be building upon itself to eventually get us to a magnificent formula called CAPM, the Capital Asset Pricing Model, okay? Which gives us a relationship between an individual asset's systematic risk and the reward that you expect to receive for investing within that asset to then tell us what's the expected return of my asset based upon that systematic portion 
that exists within that particular asset and portfolio. Again, weighted, you're not going to be able to get away from that. Right? So when we think about total return, right? we're talking about what's my expected return plus what's my unexpected return. And we think about, we know what the expected return is, right? We've calculated that. And our unexpected return is the combination of what return is related to the systematic portion and the unsystematic portion okay? across all asset classes versus asset specific classes. Okay? So when we think about the total return a different way, we can say the total return is equal to the expected return okay, plus our systematic portion of the return plus the unsystematic portion of the return. Okay. So now we've brought in the concept of surprises okay, to the conversation. We had, we've been talking about expected return for the last one and a half lectures. And tonight we're going to be having this conversation in further detail around what portion of my total return is now comprised of systematic return and the unsystematic return. So this is where diversification becomes very important. And some of this is not new to, to you guys. All right. But portfolio diversification it simply means that we're investing in different asset classes or sectors. It doesn't mean we're just holding a bunch of assets, right? So if we buy 50, you know, internet cloud computing companies, okay, we're not diversified, okay? Because we're still within the cloud computing sector and therefore we're still exposed to the systematic risk and all of the unsystematic risk associated with the cloud computing sector. So just because we hold a bunch of assets doesn't mean we're diversified. The important thing here is that if we're diversified, we are holding assets across several different asset classes or sectors. That is what helps us diversify away the unsystematic risk. Okay. So Again, if you own 50 internet stocks, that doesn't mean you're diversified because you're still tied to the internet sector. However, if you own 50 stocks that cover 20 different industries, then you are theoretically diversified, right? So in terms of how does the standard deviation, again, can't get away from math, not in my class, right? So how does the number of holdings within a portfolio impact the standard deviation of a portfolio. Okay, and that's what this table is trying to give us an idea about. Okay, so if we have one stock in the portfolio, okay, then historically, okay, the standard deviation of that portfolio is roughly 49.24%, huge number, lots of variability with just one holding. And that makes a lot of sense, right? If you held Tesla, right, as one holding in your portfolio, you've had to deal with some pretty big swings, both positive and negative over the last three to five years. Okay, so really high standard deviation. Okay, and as we begin to add positions to our portfolio, okay, we see the standard deviation begin to fall. Okay, we begin to diversify, we begin to weed out some of that unsystematic risk within our portfolio in order to narrow our variability to be able to generate more consistent returns. That's what we want, okay? We need variability, we need volatility because without volatility, we get no reward. So we need some level of volatility, right? But at what point, okay, at what point do we stop getting the benefit of diversification. So where does the standard deviation begin to flatten out? Where does the asymptote begin to 
begin to uh, build, all right? And if you look here, we can see the standard deviation drop off pretty significantly up until the first 10 holdings, right? We go from 49% to 23%, so near a, more than a 50% reduction in volatility, okay? And then it kind of begins to flatten out. And by the time we get in here to this 25 to 30 holdings, okay, we really start to see very, very, very little change in the standard deviation of the portfolio once we get past 20 to 25 holdings, okay? So this tells us that diversification, we can substantially reduce the variability, volatility of returns, okay? Without an equivalent reduction in expected returns, right? Because if, we're, if we are taking this much volatility, accepting this much volatility, obviously we should be paid for that, right, in the form of return, but, but you got to remember, positive and negative, okay, positive and negative, right, so what we want is we want the ability to generate consistent returns over a period of time, and we see that we can do that in general, anywhere from, anywhere from 10 to 30 holdings, depending upon the size of the portfolio, okay, all right, but that's where it really begins to flatten out on that asymptote related to the systematic risk associated with the portfolio. Okay, so what we want is we want to we want to diversify, okay, in such a way that we substantially reduce the variability, volatility. We like to sleep better at night, okay, and we want to be able to generate more consistent returns over a period of time. Okay? So this reduction in risk, okay, comes about because our worse than respected returns in one asset are offset by the better than expected returns in other assets, okay? And hopefully if we've designed the portfolio correctly and we've taken into account at least current market conditions, okay, we get more upside than we do downside, okay? So we generate a little alpha within the portfolio. But you have to keep in mind that no matter how many holdings you put into your portfolio, okay, you cannot diversify everything out. There is always going to be a minimum level of risk that is going to exist. That minimum level of risk is the systematic portion of the portfolio risk level. Okay, no matter how many holdings you have, you can't, you simply can't get rid of it. Okay, because the systematic risk impacts a broad variety of sectors, no matter what. So when we look at this chart, I love this chart. This is just, I, I actually have this printed out. And when I go, I'll tell you a little story. So I, I uh, signed a new client last week and lovely lady, lovely lady. And in her IRA, okay, her IRA was worth, I don't know, somewhere to the tune of just, just shot of probably $2 million, okay? But when she showed me her statement, I almost fell out of my chair. It had 279 positions, 279 positions in her portfolio. Okay, of individual companies, all right? Now she's 71 years old, okay? And I, I love math and I can, I love Excel, God's greatest gift to, you know, the, the scientific world, but no one in their right mind can keep track of 279 positions, okay? And so I used this, this chart, this figure here when I was speaking with her. Okay, and I'm having, this I'm having the exact same conversation with her last week that I'm having with you tonight. When we think about volatility, all right, we want some vol, right? We want some vol because vol creates returns. Vol gives us reward. We want some, okay? But we want to be smart about it. We don't want to take unnecessary risks. So we need to diversify to get our risk level down to a point where that risk is consistent and we can generate consistent returns. 
And so when we take the table we were just looking at and we flip it over here into chart form, we can see, all right, that at some point we begin to hit an asymptote against the systematic non-diversifiable risk contained within the portfolio, okay? And that sits somewhere around that 25 holding range, okay? So somewhere between 20 and 30, we get and for 20 and higher, we get no incremental benefit for adding holdings. So what we have to be is we have to be very smart about how we diversify within that first 20 to 25 positions, okay? Because once we do that, once we get smart about this, everything else doesn't even matter, okay? I could build a portfolio of 20 holdings and it could be a $10 million portfolio with only 20 holdings and it would have the same level of risk, just larger sized positions, okay? So we want to diversify risk out. We want to eliminate the, the unsystematic portion. Okay, that's what all this is, the blue area here. We want to eliminate as much of this as possible, okay? That's our goal through diversification, right? So diversifiable risk. It's that risk which we can diversify out Okay. by combining assets intelligently, by intelligently combining assets into a portfolio. Okay. So, so this, the risk that we're getting rid of when we do that is that asset-specific, unsystematic risk. Very, very important there. Okay. All right, so total risk equals systematic risk plus unsystematic risk. Right? So the total level of risk that we're taking within a portfolio right, is equal to that which we cannot diversify and that which we can diversify. So total risk all right, is equal to the systematic component plus the unsystematic component. Right? So stick with me. We're getting there. This is going to be fun. I love, like, I think these next like, six slides are some of my most favorite slides to, 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 teach, up, to teach on. Um, almost maybe throughout the whole semester, aside from time value and, money. and discounted cash flow. I love that. Too. All right. So again, total risk, systematic, unsystematic. The standard deviation, as we've talked about, right, is the measure of the total risk. How much variability around those average returns are you taking? Are you willing to accept, aka risk? Okay. So for well diversified, intelligently designed portfolios, okay, there's very little unsystematic risk to the point where we can say it's zero. Okay. So in relation to the systematic risk, if we've designed our portfolio properly we can essentially call the unsystematic risk component zero. Okay, because remember, the unsystematic component approaches the systematic level of risk asymptotically. Okay, so once we start to get close to that systematic risk inherent within the portfolio, in relation to the systematic risk, we can essentially attribute zero to the unsystematic risk, okay? Very, very small, okay? So when we do that, we are essentially making this assumption that for a diversified portfolio, the total risk is equal to the systematic risk. Okay? What impact does GDP or inflation or interest rates have on our overall portfolio? Nothing else, just the systematic risk leads us into the risk principle. And we've talked about this throughout the whole semester. Okay. We want and should be rewarded for taking risk. Okay. We should receive a reward commensurate with the level of risk that we are taking within the market. Okay. However, if we take risks unnecessarily, okay, willy-nilly, then there's, we should not expect a reward for bearing that risk unnecessarily. So if we think about 
risky assets, okay, then the expected return on those risky assets, okay, that which we're willing to bet on, okay, depends only on that asset's systematic risk. Why? Because we can diversify out all of the other risk. Okay? If we're going to put money into a position that contains risk, and pretty much all of them do, with the exception of probably three month treasury bills, and we'll talk about that here in a second. Okay. There's risk associated with that. Okay? But if we combine that risky asset with other assets, we diversify out all the unsystematic risk, then the assets systematic risk is all that exists since we've already gotten rid of everything else. Okay, so the expected return on a risky asset okay, can be solely correlated to the systematic risk that you as the investor are willing to bear by adding that asset to the portfolio. Okay. So how do we go about measuring systematic risk? Okay. Well, in the portfolio risk metrics world, investments world, my world, your world this semester, okay, we have a metric, okay? And that metric is the beta coefficient, okay? Beta is a measure of systematic risk. Right. If you were to go take uh, Doug uh, Doug Young's, you know, derivatives course, okay, you would get into much further detail on how to actually physically go calculate beta. Suffice to say, I'm not going to get into that with you guys, but you need to understand that beta is a correlation and covariance calculation that exists between two assets. When one asset moves, how does the other one move? Okay, so beta is a measurement of correlation and covariance between two different assets. Okay, so what does the beta coefficient tell us? Right, if we have a beta coefficient that is equal to one, so beta is equal to one, okay, then it means that the asset that we're looking at has the same level of systematic risk that the overall market does, okay? If, um, if Pfizer has a beta coefficient of one and the S&P 500, because it is the market, has a beta coefficient of one, okay, then it means that Pfizer as an individual asset contains as much systematic risk, okay, non-diversifiable risk as the market does. Okay. If we have a beta that's less than one, then that asset has less systematic risk than the overall market. If an asset has a beta greater than one, then the asset has more systematic risk than the overall market. Okay, so if we look at a table of beta coefficients from a couple of years ago, I need to update this, I apologize, right? And they're probably pretty much still the same to be quite frank, with the exception of maybe Tesla, that's probably changed quite a bit, right? We see what the different beta coefficients are. J and J, Johnson and Johnson has less systematic risk, okay, in its business, okay, than the overall market does. Okay, Coca-Cola, less systematic risk. Apple, significantly more systematic risk. Same with the media companies, okay, as consumer uh, behaviors change. Okay, companies that are tied to consumer behavior, Tesla, Ford, Apple, CB, C, uh, CBS, they will change more, vol they're more volatile, they contain more systematic risk as consumer buying patterns change. Okay, people aren't exactly very likely to give up their salty and sweet snacks, okay, and their sodas, even in a recession. Okay, so there's, an, there's inherently less systematic risk with defensive style companies. Okay, you could drop Pepsi in here as well with Coca-Cola, J&J or Procter and Gamble or Kimberly Clark. Okay, put all of that in there. Okay, 
less systematic risk than the overall market. Okay, so if we think about if we think about companies that have standard deviations, measure volatility, measure risk, and we think about those betas, which companies have more systematic risk than others, okay? Which security contains more total risk? Any ideas? Total risk. K, security K, higher standard deviation, more volatility, more variability around the mean, okay? More total risk. Okay, expected return plus systematic plus unsystematic. We've diversified unsystematic out, so we're left with expected return and systematic risk. Okay. Which security has more systematic risk? Okay, more systematic risk is defined by beta. So because security C has the higher beta, it has higher systematic risk then security K at 0.95, right? So it has almost 30% more systematic risk than security K, right? Now, which security should have the higher expected return? Okay, security C should have the higher expected return because you still have a fairly decent standard deviation, but you have more systematic risk that you can't diversify away. Therefore, you're taking more risk with security C, and therefore, if you're taking more risk, you should have the higher return, okay? All right, here we go. Back to the weightings, Morgan. All right. Oh. Yes, more weightings. All right, so we have the same four holdings. We have the same weights from the previous slides and we have the betas for each of the four companies. What's the portfolio beta? Well, it's super simple. It's the sum product of the weight and the beta. Okay, weight times beta plus weight times beta, weight times beta, weight times beta, add everything up. So the weighted average beta for this portfolio is 1.147. So it has 14.7% more systematic risk than the market, okay? Which means that you should expect to have a, a higher total return, okay? On this portfolio, all right? when compared to the market, okay? More risk, more reward, always. Okay. So now we're building, okay? We're building on this concept, all right? Of an individual assets level of systematic risk compared to a market systematic risk where the beta is equal to one, okay? And if we believe that the markets are in equilibrium with one another, how does the beta of an asset correlate to the beta of the market? Okay, we're moving, we're getting so close to the capital asset pricing model, right? So we now got the portfolio beta, some product, weighted average, okay? Weight and beta. So when we talked last week, in the week prior about the risk premium. We said that the risk premium okay, was the reward, AKA the return that we should expect above and beyond the risk-free rate of return. So our risk premium is equal to the expected return of our asset minus our risk-free rate, okay, whatever that is. In general, it's the three-month treasury bills. We say that's risk-free because, you know, the, it's the returns and the asset that you'd be buying is backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government, okay? We'll see how that turns out in the next 10 years. But nonetheless, the risk premium is the difference between 
the expected return of the asset, like we've been talking about, the expected return, okay, minus the return of the risk-free rate. Okay. The higher the beta, the greater the risk, the greater the risk, the higher your expected return, the higher your expected return, the higher your risk premium. Okay. So when you see a widening in the risk premium, okay, it's a clear indicator, right, that you're taking more risk, okay, which means your beta should be higher. So we start to develop a correlation between the risk premium and beta. Okay. As we take more risk, our expected return goes up. And if our expected return goes up, then our risk premium widens out. So is there a way where we can develop a relationship between the risk premium and beta in order to calculate the expected return? Yes, there is. And it's called the securities market line. And it's awesome. Okay. So if we have beta, okay, on the x-axis, right, which is a measurement of systematic risk, more risk, higher reward, right? More risk, higher reward. That's the whole premise. Why take risk if you're not going to be rewarded for the level of risk that you're taking? We can develop the securities market line. So if we have the beta for an asset and the expected return for an asset and we know what the risk-free rate of return is, right? Anybody remember what the formula for a line is back from their high school math days? Sorry. Y equals MX plus B. There you go. It's one of the formulas that no matter how old you get or what industry you work in, you never forget the formula. Y equals MX plus B, right? So Y, the expected return, okay, equals the slope, okay, the slope, all right, the, the slope times X plus B, where B is the risk-free rate of return. Okay. Now, what's the slope? Rise over run, right? Okay, so what's our rise? What is our rise? What is, in, in, in words, not numbers, what is the rise? We have our expected return minus our risk-free rate of return. So what does the rise represent? It represents our risk premium, right? That is the risk premium. Okay, so when we think about, and so rise, risk premium, okay, over run, which is the beta of the asset minus zero. So the risk premium divided by the beta of the asset, that is the slope of the line, right? So we call that the risk to reward ratio, okay? So 20 was our expected return, eight was our risk-free rate of return, the beta was 1.6. So the rise was 12, so our risk premium was 12, okay? In this example, so from here to here represented 12 percentage points, and we had 1.6 and zero, so 1.6. So our risk reward ratio is 7.5. Okay. So if the asset that we might be considering has a reward to risk ratio of eight, okay, you have a steeper slope, right? You ought to be getting paid more. You're getting rewarded more for the same level of systematic risk. Okay. If it has a reward to risk ratio of seven, okay, the slope has flattened out a little bit, right? And so you're getting paid less reward for commensurate level of risk that you're also taking. Okay. So when we think about the slope of the securities market line, nothing more than the risk premium divided by the beta of the asset. Okay, so the risk premium for the asset, okay, 
divided by the beta of the asset is the slope of the security market line. Okay, I want to say that one more time because I want you to remember it. The slope of the security market line is equal to the expected, the risk premium for the asset divided by the beta for the asset. Okay. So, when the markets are in equilibrium, okay, then all of the assets and the portfolios okay, must have the same reward to risk ratio. This is very important. This is the big assumption that we have to make, right? When the markets are in equilibrium and everything is fairly priced okay, and efficient markets are functional, okay, then all of the assets and all of the portfolios must have the exact same reward to risk ratio and they must all equal the reward to risk ratio for the market, okay? Because if the markets are in equilibrium, then what exists for the asset and the portfolio must also exist for the market as a whole, okay? And when we do this, when we make this assumption and we believe that the markets are in equilibrium and we believe in efficient market theory, it tells us that when we think about the risk premium for the asset that we just looked at on the chart, the expected return of the asset minus the risk-free rate of return divided by the beta of the asset, okay? We can then correlate that to the market by saying the expected return of the market is e minus the risk-free rate of return. So the risk premium for the market divided by the beta of the market, okay? That those two, when everything is in equilibrium, then those two must be the same, okay? Therefore, the security market line Okay, that we were just looking at as an example, okay, is the representation of market equilibrium. Okay. And the slope of the security market line is, is equal to the reward to risk ratio, right? Or, okay, or the risk premium, okay, divided by the beta of the market. But now, since the beta of the market okay, is always equal to one, because that's what it's all based upon, okay? the beta of Pfizer was not one. It was in relation to one. The correlation covariance to the market resulted in Pfizer being 0.99, okay? or Apple being 1.44. Correlation between that individual asset and the market, the covariance and correlation resulted in that beta coefficient, okay? But the beta for the market is always one. Now we can say the slope of the securities market line is the risk premium, okay? So how do we now translate the risk premium? How do we bring the risk premium together with the beta, okay? Because remember, beta is a measurement of systematic risk. The expected return is the level of risk that we should expect to receive based upon the risk that we're taking. The reward, the expected return is the reward we should expect to receive based on the level of risk that we're taking. How do we bring all of that together to calculate the expected return of an asset in relation to the market. Okay. And here comes the capital asset pricing model. The capital asset pricing model is the model that defines the relationship between the risk and the reward that you're going to expect from the investment. 
So the expected return of the asset that you are investing in, okay, is equal to y equals mx plus b, okay? Y, the expected return of the asset. M is the slope, okay? What did we say the slope was? We said the slope was the risk premium, right? X is the beta of the asset, okay? So Y, M, X plus B. The Y intercept is the risk-free rate of return. Okay. So the expected return of the asset okay, is equal to the risk-free rate of return, the minimum level of return you should expect to get based upon taking the least amount of risk possible, plus the beta of the asset, the measurement of the systematic risk of the asset times the risk premium of the market. What's the expected return of the market minus the risk-free rate of return, okay? This product gives us the expected return of the asset okay, based upon the specific systematic risk that is inherent within the asset that we're invested within. Okay. So if we know the asset's systematic risk, which we can calculate using the correlation and covariance uh, statistics, okay, we can calculate the asset's systematic risk then we can use the capital asset pricing model okay, to determine the asset's expected return. Right? And it doesn't matter if we're talking about physical assets or financial assets because the beta right, is asset specific and is only a measurement of the systematic risk inherent within the asset that we're referring to, whether it's physical or financial. Okay. So what things do affect right, our expected returns? Three things, as we saw within the formulas, three things that are basically involved here, right? Time value of money. Interest rates are gonna change within the marketplace, right? The Federal Reserve, and I just heard today that it uh, looks like Biden is gonna be nominating Janet Yellen as the, the, the Treasury Secretary, okay? So we've got an interest rate component. And the interest rate component is measured by the risk-free rate, okay? This piece, the risk-free rate of return. We've got the reward that we should receive based upon our willingness to bear systematic risk. And that, that value is measured by the market risk premium, okay? Our return above and beyond this risk-free rate of return, okay? And then finally, how much systematic risk are we taking, okay? What's the beta of our asset or our portfolio, okay? So we've got a time value of money component, okay? We've got a, the reward for bearing risk, okay? The risk premium. And then finally, how much systematic risk are we taking as measured by the beta? Okay, so that is the capital asset pricing model. The expected return of the asset is equal to the risk-free rate of return plus the beta of the asset times the risk premium, the market risk premium, okay? All right, any questions? Will you be posting the spreadsheets on Moodle? <laughs> Man, you guys ask so much for me. Posting all my answers? Yeah, of course, I'll put them out there. I'll put them out there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Okay, and I'll have, there'll be some connect homework out there that deals specifically with CAPM and risk premiums and betas. You're not going to have to calculate the beta, but you just, you do need to understand how to use the beta not only in terms of how to calculate the expected return of an asset with a given beta for the asset, but to how to calculate the beta of a portfolio, okay, given the weightings of 
individual assets that comprise the portfolio. Okay, so I'll get some connect homework put out there uh, for everybody to work on. And then, so next week, um, I kind of wanted to give you guys the, <laughs> no pun intended, the option. Okay, we can have two conversations next week if you want or spend more time on one versus the other. So there's two, there's two topics that I kind of wanted to touch on before, because we've only got next week, um, that will be our final lecture. And then we go into uh, the final exam. Um, I'd like to get into a conversation around options. Okay, so buying and selling or buying and writing is the, the terminology is more appropriately called buying and writing call and put options, okay? And a little bit around um, how companies go about using options to hedge against whatever, foreign currency fluctuation, price of coal or natural gas fluctuations, you know, things like that. So that is that is a, a topic um, for consideration. And then the, the other topic for consideration is the weighted average cost of capital, um, the WAC, all right? where we'll get into more of a conversation around how the debt and the equity components within our balance sheet go about help and the amount of debt that we have, the interest rates that we have on our debt, how that goes about creating the weighted average cost of capital, AKA discount rate um, that your companies may use and do use for uh, when they're, you, when they're you know, running through their discounted cash flow valuations. So, I can tell you right now that in terms of options, we would easily take most of the most of the lecture time next week discussing options. Um, with the WAC, we could probably get through the WAC in about half the lecture and spend some some time then talking about options, but I would not be able to get into um, the level of detail that um, I would like to around options and the different types of options and how they're used. So any preference? Is there anything that you would prefer to learn more about? I would like to learn more about the WAC. About WAC, okay. Mm -hmm. That's fun. I, I, WAC is wacky. <laughs> I would prefer options, honestly, but I mean, I could go either way. Okay, so here's what we'll do. I will design, I'll, I'll like rework my lecture for next week to accommodate both. Okay. Okay. It'll take a little bit of time on my part, but I don't mind doing it. Obviously, that's why I'm here. So I will rework um, the lecture for next week. So we will cover, we will cover the basics of options and WAC in next week's lecture. Professor B, have you, um, I assume you haven't, like you don't have a pre-recorded lecture on either of those, like maybe that's an option to have post that. Um, I have a couple of supplemental recorded lectures that deal more specifically with how to go about calculating like the payoff and profitability for a, for buying a call option or writing a call option or buying a put option or writing a put option that I'll certainly put out there after we have um, our conversation. Um, but I want to, I want to be able to spend some time kind of, you know, in person uh, discussing option theory. Okay. And then one more question. Is this our last time meeting before the final or Next Will week. we have a like a, a final like review, like a recap about what to focus on for the final? So we'll kind of do that uh, next week. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll, what I'll do too. Here's what I'll do. I'll also put a separate little lecture, not lecture, recording out there that'll discuss specifically the final. Okay. Because whether I say it in class next week or whether I say it just as an ad hoc, you know, video, it's the same. It'll be the same topic. So I'd rather not take class time away. And I'll put I'll try to get that get that out there 
um, within the next couple of days before Thanksgiving. That way, if you know, you can watch it at your at your leisure. And if you have questions about the final, you can reach out, and I can make sure to get back to everybody about any sort of clarification. Is that final on the fourteenth? Who asked that? That's uh, Eric. Eric. I knew somebody was going to ask that, which is now going to force me to go back to my Loyola calendar here. Syllabus has us down on the 14th, but then you said next week's our last lecture. Hold on a second. I looked at this earlier. I may not have updated the syllabus based because I don't think they had actually put the, uh, the the exam schedule out there when I did the syllabus. But let me just let me just check here. Exams and close of fall semester, December 8, 14, 16 and 17. Can I, can I get back with you on that? Is that okay? Yeah, that's fair. Okay, I apologize for that. When I first saw it, I, I, I thought that it was gonna be um, a week from next Monday would have been our exam. But I mean, let me just confirm, let me just confirm with, uh, with the program. Okay, sorry about that.